Welcome to the Dance NYC 2022 Symposium, Life Cycles, Livelihoods, Legacies. We will be with you shortly. Today's schedule. After this morning's warm welcome and wake up, we will now begin our 10 o'clock morning sessions. At 11.30, we'll move our bodies to a community dance break led by Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance. Our early afternoon sessions will begin at 12 p.m., followed by a nourishing lunch at 1.30. At this time, you may also explore our exhibitor hall, where we will host the virtual expo showcase. At 2.30, we will begin our late afternoon sessions, followed by a 4.15 community daily debrief, where all attendees are encouraged to attend and discuss the day's activities. At five o'clock, head over to our exhibitor hall to explore our second virtual expo showcase of the day. And at six o'clock, we will present our keynote presentation. Accessibility, ASL interpretation and live captioning will be provided for today's session. A stream to text link will be posted in the chat and participation guide for access to the live transcription. Stay connected with us by posting your takeaways on social media using the hashtags DanceSimp, DanceNYC2022, and DanceSimp2022. On Instagram at dance.nyc, on Twitter at dance.nyc, and on Facebook at dance slash nyc. Community Guidelines Based on Dance NYC's values of justice, equity, and inclusion, we agree to share our opinions, challenge perspectives, and engage or debate respectfully, and acknowledge and course correct if harm is caused. Honor everyone's personhood and humanity. Not tolerate speech that is disparaging, abusive, violent, or that is intended to defame someone's character publicly. Some features not to miss. Build your agenda of sessions. Connect with other attendees. Join community conversations. Visit the exhibitor hall. Don't forget to check out the 2022 Symposium Digital Program Book. We are happy to be in community with you. Thanks for joining. Hi everyone, this is Kyle Rudnick. I am the operations manager for Dance NYC. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I am a white cisgender male of German and Puerto Rican descent. I am wearing a blue patterned uh, blazer with a maroon sweater, black framed glasses, and behind me is a white wall with uh, two pieces of artwork. I identify as someone with dyslexia and auditory processing disorder. And today I am calling in from the land of the Lenape, Manhattan, currently known as Manhattan. First, thank you for joining us for the completely digital 2022 symposium held on Whova platform. As we are at the mercy of technology, uh, we just want to remind you that there may be some delays, sound issues, and changing circumstances that may occur during our time together. We just invite you to extend us and each other grace and patience. Second, ASL interpreters from Sign Nexus and closed captioning services provided by the Viscardi Center will be available throughout the session. A stream to text link will also be available and post it in the chat for further reference. We will also post speaker information in the description below and under the speakers module on the left side of your Whova web app or the menu of your Whova mobile app. This information is also available on our website. Third, feel free to post comments to 
what you want to share with the community in the chat section to the right of this event room. Dance NYC moderators will be interacting with you there. For this session, the panelists have decided to not hold a Q&A to ensure a presence of mind and ease in the conversation. However, please feel free to post your comments and reflections in the chat for the community's benefit. After the session ends, there will be a session follow up in the community section of Whova where you can continue the conversation. Lastly, we hope that you will enjoy us, excuse me, we hope that you will help us <laughs> to amplify these conversations. Repost, tag us, share your, your takeaways on Twitter. Uh, the Twitter is at DanceNYC. Instagram is at dance.nyc. And Facebook is dance slash NYC. Or you can also use the hashtag dance simp, S Y M P. And now we enter how long has this been going on? In Edward Said's infamous book, Cultural and Imperialism, which was from 1993, he wrote, Narrative is Power. This conversation presents innovative inter interpretations on said's quote to demonstrate how the work of Black, Indigenous, and disabled artists is redirecting narrative and power through their arts making. Moderated by Kyle Dakuyen, speakers expand on how cultural narratives might become reparative when they are supported, produced and presented accessibly to their communities. Curated with George Emilio Sanchez, now welcoming Kyle du, uh, Dakuyen to begin this session. Welcome Kyle, thank you. Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you to Hussein Simcoe for bringing intention and context to this space. And thank you to Kyle Rednick for welcoming us. I'm Kyle Dekuyan, joining you from St. Mark's Church on the unceded homelands of the Lenape people in greater Lenape Kohang. My pronouns are flexible. And as a visual description, I am a Filipinx person with short brown hair wearing a white shirt and white jacket. And I am in an office with a window surrounded by piles of books and paper. I am a poet, performance maker, and executive director of the Poetry Project at St. Mark's. And I'm very grateful to be gathered this morning with Alice Shepard, Nia Love, and Andre Bouchard for how long has this been going on? In our preparatory correspondence and conversation for this panel, some questions, frictions, and counterpoints surfaced around the frame of narrative. What it is and why it is and for whom it is, has been, will be, could be, needn't be. We thought about the transmissions of narrative across time, the ways in which embodiment examines a deeper narrative, authorship and co-authorship, We've thought about narrative and civic relations and structures, and perhaps most expansively, we've been thinking together about what fields for making, observing, absorbing, and exchanging we might manifest beyond narrative. I'm very excited and appreciative that we will be extending this rich, complex conversation this morning. And before we get into it, We'll take some time now for the speakers in this morning's panel to introduce themselves. To keep things rolling, I will go around the group to suggest a sequence, and it would be great if we could start with Alice Shepard. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Alice Shepard, and I am deeply grateful to be here. I am 
a multiracial black woman. My pronouns are she, hers. I am seated here on the ancestral homelands of the Lenape peoples on the Isle of Manahata, Manhattan. I am a coffee-colored skinned black woman with gray-brown curly hair. I am wearing a brown sweater, which has pointy collars framing my neck. I am queer and disabled. Behind me is a white wall and a frame with a window. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Alice. And Andre Bouchard. Good morning. It is an honor to be with you all this morning. My name is Andre Bouchard. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I am a light brown mixed race uh, man of native and European descent. Um, my uh, background is a wood panel, a cream colored wood panel um, with diagonal stripes. Um, I am currently on the lands of the Squaxin Island and Nisqually tribes. <clears throat> and it is, it is an honor to be here again. Thanks so much, Andre. And Nia Love. Good morning, everyone. Blessed to see your faces, at least the people that I can see here. I'm excited and honored to be a part of this company of spirits. I am residing on Lenape land up in Harlem uh, on Manhattan Island. Um, I am a brown colored cis woman um, wearing my hair up in a, a kind of uh, knot, if you will. I have a yellow and blue African shirt called a kaba on. I am sitting in my living room and behind me is a picture of a Tutankhamen's um, exhibit from, wow, I, I think that exhibit is like 1980s in uh, Washington, D.C. that my father had and it's been living with me ever since. Also a painting that my father uh, did called Legacy. Um, I think I, I think that was it. I think that, that's a check. That's great. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for your introductions. And thanks so much for all of your thinking in advance of this conversation. Um, so the title or preface line for this panel, How Long Has This Been Going On, had us thinking about time and what it is to be living and making in bodies and places that change across time. And Nia shared a beautiful pro provocative suggestion, which I wanna bring forward this morning, uh, that the frame brings to mind what she called, quote, my relationship to my own ontology. And I thought we could start our conversation this morning by asking how is narrative a useful or complex or unhelpful frame for considering our relationships to our own ontologies. And um, maybe we can start with Andre. Narrative, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so, so sort of a little bit of context uh, for, for me, I, I work as a producer, um, of, of dance and other performing arts entirely for native and indigenous um, people and uh, performing artists who are touring usually. And um, so the work I do is usually a little bit behind the scenes um, as, as a director um, or producer. And it's interesting, I, uh, the, the, the first thoughts that I, I 
come to when approaching a new project is how it how it interacts with my culture and my community and so much of my identity my ontology as it were um is reflective of that identity that place within the space of my culture and my community um the narratives that I, I generate, the narratives that I, I foster in the creative community that I have brought around me um, sort of support a, a life cycle of connection throughout it. Uh, and, and this isn't this isn't my uh, concept necessarily. I, I, um, I was given this by Auntie Margot Kane, who, uh, founded the Talking Stick Festival in Vancouver. Um, and there's a sort of a decolonized cycle. And sort of as, as, you know, sort of my metaphysical state of being, this is something I've been referring back to for very heavily for the last five years. And that looks at the ideas of inception of your, your creative piece. Uh, so if you're going to bring a work to stage, what you know you know what what if, if there's a narrative what it is and that sort of thing so inception uh creation so now that's the act of getting into the studio and actually making the darn thing um and then the production staging it and that sort of thing um touring and presentation and then reflection afterwards or more commonly thought of in um sort of the dominant narrative is it's criticism and taking each of those individual elements and breaking them down and asking how that interacts with the community that you have, the culture you have, who you are working with ultimately. Um, because that is, that is the question that I, I, I revolve around. Is, is how am I serving? How am I bringing people together? What questions am I asking and answering? Um, yes, I, I, I could go on and on about this. Um, this is supposed to be a discussion, uh, however, and I saw Nia nodding her head when I said Auntie Margot, because um, she, she uh, has impacted many, many, many people, not just myself. Um, but yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to push in on Auntie Margo, yeah. but I really want to push on an Auntie, right? Because yeah. I want to think about the stories that I've been told since I was a baby, even maybe in vitro, right? The songs that I that that were sung to me, um, the way that I was held, the way that I came out into the world the story that I was told about my birth and what the night looked like or the day. I want to talk about that as narrative, right? And that, and that do I need to name this thing as narrative, right? Because I think about the relationship of the etymology of this like word, right? Which feels really third person, right? That someone else is telling us what this thing is or who these people are, or what they do, right? And so I want to just bring that back to auntie, because I believe that those types of ceremonies, if you will, those types of practices that were a part of me, even really probably before I was born, right? So we're talking about like, you know, the importance of a, of, a, of a kind of journeying to be together from people who were, were moving in the world, right? In so many multiplicity of ways. I'm talking about black and brown people really. Um, that like gave me information songs and stories and ancestral memories right that and they and they gave 
that to me in this space of like love, even when I wasn't even there before I was even thought of, right? So this, this idea of a narrative for me, you know, it's complex, right? And yet it's so innately embodied in the first person that also is extended deeply into these other realms of space of knowledge and ontology. And that's why I guess I really kind of like flipped that question when we were all like chatting that day. Um, and I really love what, what Alice said, because Alice rolled up and she was like, they were like, I don't, I, I mean, you know, this is, it's not a quote, Alice. So, you know, come in and slice it up. You go ahead, you go ahead. But I feel like you were like, there's no, like narrative implies this, like, again, this kind of singleness, like this individuality, right? And there's no narrative that has a single narrative ever, which is the content around what I am trying to, not trying, no, what I am embracing in my aunties. Yeah, so I, I yeah, yeah. Oh, um, may I, may I continue? Please. Um, thank you, uh, Andre and Nia. I have worried at this question um, because of that notion of what is an, a narrative. And I feel so strongly that there is a kind of operating fiction that there are a series of cultural narratives that are contentious and difficult and that somehow artists will change all of this if only artists just tell their stories as if this were an individual story where of course narratives are harder, more beautiful, more interconnected, more personal. Um, and I also kind of worry about the second side of this, which is for me a consistent worrying at the fact that narratives themselves are mm, not, not, not subject, not informed, not shaped, not, not massaged by the things that are, that are, that are outside of us. So when I look in, I look in at the internalized ableism the internalized racism, the internalized homo and transphobia. I, I look in and I recognize that even as I set the narrative, a narrative, the daily narrative of what might be in my community, from my community, with my community, I, I might be able to, to, I also have work to do. I also have work to do. It's not that my narrative is stable and enough and, 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 and enough to counter this. My narrative is constantly to be chewed at and chewed with so that the work that we do is actually of the communities that we are. Yeah. And, and, and Nia, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I just I, want to say, yeah, like, um, yeah, snaps. I mean, for those that cannot see me, I want to say narrative is embodied. Narrative is living. I love that you said chewed away at, like it's now it's, it's, it's up, it's up to be questioned, to be queried, to be troubled, right? To be dangerous, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I would, I would contribute perhaps that, that, there, there are many stories. I mean, I, I, I grew up on, on um, 
the Flathead Reservation, um, the community, which I, one of them, which I descend from. And there, there are several different stories that, that I grew up with. And one was to shape the world around me, that the elders told me, that my parents told me. And, and then there are stories, you know, there are stories about the day like the present and that sort of thing, like oh, someone did this, someone did that. And that's sort of like how we shape our community. Like, and then there are stories that you sort of hold in your bones. And uh, those, are, those are the stories about, you know, shared destiny. Uh, my tribe, the Kuni tribe um, has, you know, a legend that, 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 even though we are not many, we will never be extinguished from the face of the earth. And that, that's a story about our survivance from colonialism. And that's a longer story. And that's a story that we hold in our bones. Yes. And... yes. <laughs> Hang on, we're just going to go mics off to say yes for that <laughs> moment. Yes. So, even though, may I say it again? Oh, well, actually, can I invite you? To, would you? Would you say it again? Uh, the, the the stories that the, the stories that we hold in our bones, the stories about the future, the stories about our our collective destiny, and that the, the stories that yeah, and that the, there are, there are many types of stories that we have, and as as you know, people who who take to stage, who people who 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 tell these stories, that that uh, it's you know we are the carrier of these we are you know as 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 members of cultures and communities that are have oral traditions mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. our stories are important to us my the, the stories that i had when i was a child told me how to treat my elders and mm -hmm. how to treat the environment around me and how how to be clever and how you know how to be respectful and all the things and um, part, part of my work in the little organization that I run is, is to just try to elevate these things against the, the colonialist narrative, right? So other people have to. And there's also this, this thing, right, that, that um, you know, beyond the ways of like capitalism or the dominant culture teaches us these ways to kind of forget or, you know, think about forgetting about those, those stories that are deep inside of our bones. And, um, you know, it's like this body is scarce <laughs> of some sort, right? That's what capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, these structures, these dominant structures allude to. And so it feels like I can never forget, like you said, it's deep in the marrow. And there's something about me continuously, like having a practice that allows me to know that my body and, and my memory is not scarce. Like I'm not an individual, I can remember, right? And I hold like my practice as a choreographer or I'm challenging that word too. Like, right, the ableistic word of like the idea of like, I can, <laughs> what it is to make versus what it is to be, right? And so I'm, I'm in this place of wanting to be together or finding ways to be together to remember, finding ways to be together, right, that are, that are, um, yeah, that I can remember. All I can think of is, and I can't not remember because it's all a part of me, right? It's remembered. That means that everything that I can think of, that I quote unquote remember is a part of me. It is, it is me. And so I'm, how can I remember if I don't already have the member, right? If I don't already have this, that's, I could go on. That's, that's it. That's it. That's it. Oh my gosh, that so captures what I've been, I've been um, struggling with. Um, that 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 feeling of how can I remember if I don't 
if I don't have the member, you know. Um, yeah. 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 And, and, and yes, because because I am I am aware today of all days, right? The numerical day. It's been what exactly two years and like two to three days since the beginning of lockdowns. Um, yes, yes. And yeah, right. It that that's still it's it's deep in the body, and I recognize that that you know. So how how can you remember if you don't have the member? So many of us who are disabled. Um, you know, ah, it's a community not defined not by geography. It's a community defined by identification. Um, it's a community uh, uh, identified by affiliation. You come to us. You come to us when you're ready to say I'm a to say I'm disabled. And how can you, and 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 the memories of our elders and our people are lost. Um, and not known to us because of that kind that the necessity of 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 remembering through being a member, the necessity of remembering through remembering, and the difficulty of accessing each other, Mia coming together, the difficulty of accessing and finding each other. And so many of us are no longer with us on this planet. Our stories are, are, were known, are shared, but are shared by those of us who knew us, but maybe not communally or broadly available. Yeah, and I feel like that, right, yes, yes, and, and so many of our ancestors, so many of those people, right, that are part of our memory, right, that are part of our member, um, are still here. Their songs, if they sung, are here. Their dances are in my feet. Whether I can name them or not, um, they're in my head. They're in my fingers. Um, yeah, and there's something about, um, you know, that living compass. Come on. It's a living compass, y'all. So when we're thinking about dance or the embodiment of memory, ontology, the idea of the narrative that lives deep in the bone, right? We are a compass to the future and the past. Like we hold that. And so we have to remember, you know, all the things, all the people, when we can, you know, however it comes. Like at this point, Alice, you know, I'm 59 and Andre as well. I was just commenting <laughs> on this, not leaving you out. But y'all, I'm 59 in this body of dancing molecular states and I am suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. It, it gets a little worse as you get a little older, right? And it is the first time really in the last 10 years of this diagnosis. I want to talk about diagnosis, but we'll come back. Or the idea of being diagnosed, right? Um, that that ableism has been a part of my conversation. And I am, I am, yeah. And I feel really not happy with myself about not having that conversation before the effect hit these bones. And before the physical effect, I was scrubbing and I put a kitchen floor down in my kitchen. It took like three days. On the third day, my hands were like this. This is before I got this diagnosis. My hands were like this. And while I was putting the floor down, my hands were all gnarled. 
they were gnarled. It's Nia speaking. They were gnarled and, you know, just riddled with a lot of pain. I couldn't really work with my wrist or my elbow. It just like it radiated up through my shoulder. And um, I, on my hands and knees, putting this floor in, y'all, and I had this image of all, <laughs> maybe I don't know all, but some folks in my lineage on their hands and knees cleaning this shit like that for some white folks. Like it was clear about like, oh, this is this, this is this, this is this, boom, in the second right, that I was transposed in a way. And I thought it was through this domestic action that my memory kicked in to this ableist sensibility that was before the diagnosis. So yeah, that was just like, anyway, I, yeah, I don't know, went on to that. Yeah. With you. I wonder if we can complicate and bring that word diagnosis to thinking about the civic and collective structures that we're a part of and how, how diagnosis and narrative might be troubled together when we're thinking about our first person plural, our, our we. I'm mentally unpacking your question, Kyle. <laughs> I, 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 I sort of have something I think related to that, that idea that, that, so the, the, the question the diagnosis is means to, to identify and you know in the in the common parlance I, it's it's more diagnosis sort of means to you know identify something that's broken or hurt or hurting or something like that right and so I mean that there's there's two sides to that I mean I, I think that that by by potentially just focusing on, you know, the pain that we experience that, that we don't understand the full pathway because with every pain, we, we found a pathway into that pain and hopefully we will find a pathway out of that. And that pathway uh, sort of like, the, again, my process, it, you know, it, 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 involves reflection through my community, my family, my elders and that sort of thing. And so bringing it back to that, um, it's, it's, the, the question isn't so much for me is why I hurt because I, I, I've, I've found that, that the people, the elders in my life, you know, even though they have been diagnosed with things such as RA, things such as cancer, things, you know, ideas in Western medicine, you know, such as, you know, dementia, that, that the connection that they find with, say, their grandchildren, with their community, is medicine for them. That my mother, for instance, when, who's suffering from dementia, uh, she becomes a member of community that she hears the music of her culture that she reemerges that she becomes present again and that that is more powerful in many ways than any of the pills that she takes to to treat her and that that diagnosis um within sort of like one construct um, the, the, the cultural construct perhaps is, is more, more curative, at least, you know, in a way that matters to her and to me. Alice, you look like you want to talk. Yeah, I am. Thank you. I'm, I'm checking the ground I'm sitting on. 
right now. I am checking the ground that I am sitting on. Uh, and I am, I am checking my sits bones. I am checking my spine. And I am checking the fluid and the muscle and the body that is making contact with the surface. We're in it, right? And I, I want to come, I want to come hard and fast and come soft and slow simultaneously um, here because the work begins for me here with this question. Um, because diagnosis generates narrative. And narrative, the, and the diagnosis narrative serves as a passport to a certain context. It captures and characterizes our experiences, our embodiments, in a way that is interpretable, that gains us access to a certain set of medical legal medical legal worlds it teaches us to experience ourselves in certain ways and the practice of diagnosing contextualizes ourselves within the colonialist world and yet within community there are folks I have loved and lived with, known who I would trust my soul with, who I trust my life with, whose diagnosis I don't know and I have never shared my own diagnosis with. Because of the ways in which diagnosis can live, Diagnosis is both contextually narrative. I mean, it's, it is almost that, that question that we know about, um, that it, it's deeply racially implicated. It's deeply gendered implicated. So when we come at diagnosis and narrative, I want to look to connection and community and relationship to understand how we witness each other and what does that mean to say hello, hello. I will, I will embrace you right now for that story is, I, I will embrace you right now without needing to know your story for I know the story will come with time. I will embrace you right now but the contours of your story will grow beyond what the framework of diagnosis will give you. And also, I will embrace you right now because I know that we will be connected beyond what, what the, the world will tell you about that story. I will embrace you right now because we will be in the experience together. And so that connection for me um, goes alongside the, the narrative di of diagnosis. And I will stretch in and lean in from here to create our future together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
I have to say it's really, I feel so appreciative as someone who is primarily a poet to be thinking with people who are bringing so much language from the place and context of, of the body. Um, where you started us, Alice, by saying it's, you're checking the ground where you are and the relation of the body to the ground. Um, another, something else that we talked about in our, our earlier conversation um, was about the ways in which embodiment examines a deeper narrative. And maybe, maybe we can, maybe we even need to step away from the word narrative and just talk about how is embodiment getting us to something more submerged um, that we're trying to surface or bring outward. Well, I don't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Go near. I'm checking the ground I'm sitting on. I'm checking the ebb and flow of the fluid that moves through my spine, that holds my neck and nods it yes and no. I'm feeling this as a practice, this as a practice of presencing. And this, 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 this presencing maybe can be to the liking of an improvisation. to witness and presence oneself in the midst of, of stillness and action simultaneous. So I don't even know what your, Kyle, what you said, because I was presencing this moment so deeply profoundly like accessed and I love that like if I had the capacity to even reach behind and I do <laughs> actually my head and touch my other hand that I it, it Alice it was just like a, the it was the way that you like tap those spaces with your words and your upper part of your body that we could see that and those that can't see this elevation of a, of the of your back of the deltoid you know compressing your trap to get your arm lifted up over your head is a practice it's a work it's a process and that this notion of diagnosis, right? In its direct relationship, right? To pharmaceutical, like medical legal frame is uh, like you said, Andre, like if, if, I, if I'm partnering this with my aunties, <laughs> Right, like that, that realm of diagnosis that entraps me in the third narrative, right? Doesn't allow me to make communion and membership with all those stories that live in my bones. To find new ways beyond the ways given me because I know I have that contact with all those people, right? Transatlantic journeys, information in the water, drink it, bathe with it, wash it, 
is all here. We're in the wake of this profound reckoning. And I just want to say, Andre, I got to meet you in person. I want to dance around that circle with your people. I want to I want to sit and feel that ground with you collectively both of you Alice. I mean this I'm I'm glad to have this moment, right? But we sh and I'm just yo. <laughs> I'm in love, okay? I just want to know how to love more. I want to I want to be like good at loving. That's 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 what I'm doing this work. This work is I want to be good. I want to be really good at loving and I want to always remember you know, wherever this body is in whatever condition and state. <sighs> I'm sweating y'all. <laughs> Out of work. <laughs> to Kyle's question, you were embodying. I think you demonstrated what he what he asked. <laughs> what well, what did he ask? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was uh, the the question was around embodying, and and I think I think in, in, uh, you answered it by demonstrating it. So yeah, embodying happens when you are connected, right? Right, and like our dance backgrounds, everyone who has a dance background knows all about connecting and checking in and all that stuff. But um, um, when I feel like you're embodying, it it speaks to this meta level, this this you know this uh, spiritual mental emotional physical environmental level and that like if you are connected if you if you feel all those things if you're connected with your elders your aunties your uncles your ancestors that that these questions just come the you know the, the, the embodiment just comes and and meaning comes to you and you know if you're patient and you do your due diligence and you do your you know you do it the right way as people in my community like to say that that it comes to you and that the the, the questions the speaking back to diagnosis is a which is a question about in my feelings about the things that challenge us, but also the other side to that coin is what do we have? What reason do we have to celebrate? So flipping that coin on its other side, what, what reason do we have to celebrate? And that is, you know, for me, the connection I have with my family, with my children, with my elders, with, my ancestors, with my environment, with all these things. And these are things that guide me to, to be a good person, to be a loving person. It's not saying that I don't fail, that I don't, I don't have my challenges in the moment. I, you know, I find myself at most moments of impatience, which speaks to, you know, me not understanding that you know, time just continues that after I, you know, that after this physical being ends, that I, I just take another journey into the next world, that I just, I, I walk into the next world and I become an ancestor and there's that place too. And that, that this moment in time is just, is, is only made through my connection with it and that, that when people despoil or hurt or do any of these things that they cause pain to other people that they cause war it's because they are not connected with their community with their environment with their 
aunties and uncles and elders and ancestors and that sort of thing. And so embodiment is when everything everything is in fluid motion, that you are a conduit for all these things, that you are, you are the, the rock in the stream, that you are a part of things, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's you're my kind, embodiment. That you're a member. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Exactly. laughs> he was. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Andre, can I come back for a little bit? I want to say the body doesn't lie. But maybe worry the connection. Like the body doesn't lie, but can you trust yourself to interpret its truth? Okay. You know, uh, because I'm not, I'm not sure the connection, or at least for me, I am not sure that my connection is clear. It's not linear. It's so fragmented. It's so broken. And it's so strong simultaneously. Uh, I am not sure that I trust myself to transmit connection and story. Uh, and I am not sure that the stories that I interpret and transmit and connect to are, 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 not, are not in themselves continuing harm or, or misinterpretation or misvalue. I understand my experience, I think, but I, I'm really unsure about my interpretation and how I transmit and communicate it. I, I get that the body doesn't lie, but is my interpretation okay? Another word that has sort of, oh, go ahead, Nia. Yeah, I just wanna be, yeah, if we could just take a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so much like I feel like yeah what you're saying about interpreting of uh, these these uh, places of dis maybe disconnect I'm sorry if I put in words in your mouth Alice but this uh, this um, these these um, maybe synapses not yet like touching um for a clear for a clear thing to happen um and that is the journey i feel like yes the body doesn't lie all that information is there for eons eons like it's residence time in your body like right all that sodium all that blood Blood that's, blood, that's blood, that's blood, that's blood, that's blood, right? Again and again. And, and, and this experience here in this body, right, feels like, yeah, and especially when I'm, when I'm really feeling like I'm lost, um, I don't know. all the strong points of my body don't feel like, oh yeah, I've got that, oh, I know this, or I know this. This is a, that I know this thing, right? And it's, it's something about not knowing and that disconnect, that is, the, that is the, where the knowledge is, right? Once one knows that they don't know. It's, it then takes this other journey of sorts. It's a disconnect, it is, it is a, it is a, it is queer. It is every aspect the foundation of that word. Um, and it, it is like, yeah, I, I'm, a, and I'm also slipping now. It's a slippage. It, it, I'm also lost, like in the, but I'm feeling the reverberation of what you said, both of you. Um, I'm feel I'm feeling it, but 
I don't know, like the translation <laughs> is like, I'm feeling the translation in different members of my body. Um, and it's not coming through this mouth necessarily. And, the, and, the, and I need a minute. Yeah. I'm observing that another word that continues to enter our conversation is work. And I'm wondering how and where we become conscious that work is happening or that work is something that we're doing or that work is informing a way we are being. Well, I, I mean, I remember as a as a kid, I asked my dad. My father is a visual artist, sculptor, uh, and I think one day I asked him, "Are you going to work?" And he laughed, <laughs> and he said. Yeah, it's a kind of work. It's a strategical work. It's a practice. Versus I asked my mom, are you going to work as a secretary working for somebody? She was like, yeah, I'm going to work. So, <laughs> you know, as in every word, there is a semantic. Um, so, my idea for myself, this word, work, is a, is a practice. It, it is a way that I breathe. I don't think of the way that I am in this body right now in the, in the choice that I've chosen to accept Exhale, exhale my, my, how long has this been going on? <laughs> that exhale, right? That I'm, that I've taken, I'm not privileged, I'm I've taken it. I'm an abolitionist, I'm taking that. And exhaling that space as practice. Again, I'm trying to understand how to love better. I'm, I'm, I, I, I want to understand what this dancing body work is. So, yeah, I, I keep asking questions. I'm, I'm not answering any goddamn thing. I'm sorry. It's probably why, you know, I was always like a, one of those troubled students. Like, could you just answer the question? But yeah, I don't know if it's answerable. I just want to like look at this. Uh, yeah, how long has this been going on? All right, let's just pick one starting point. Um, you know, work. If your value outside you, mm, come on with it, it. Come on with it. Come on with it. Come on, all right, all right. Okay, right, come right on it. with it. All right. So, so one in one context, right? Disability is defined by your capacity to work or not work. <laughs> if you are forcibly brought to this land, your value is determined by your capacity to work. You cannot afford to identify as disabled or be seen or read as disabled. Though the work you do will eventually disable you. Or How read long has this been going read, on? Or read as human. It's foundational. Right. So why 
you know, some of the some of the questions are thinking through how work is embedded into every system of American life, how disability and race and queerness surface those those structures, and, and how much the intertwining of them is there, how much the pandemic has shown them, and how much we have failed to make change, how much we think about, but, and there is here, a long story, a specifically history of work that affects two of my primary communities. Um, but when we take this into the dance world, right, work is rarely surfaced. We don't, we ex the dance world expects there to be work because there is a body of work because the art that we make is known as work. And the borderlines between work the crafting, the work that we have worked to put on stage and the work that it takes to make that crafting, that work, are so lost. And the speed at which we're supposed to work, you know, the, the, like how often are you supposed to make a work to, in order to be seen as a working artist? You know, do we have these structures? Do we have, can we actually name these structures? Like, if it takes you three years to make a work, but, but what if it takes you six weeks? What if it takes you 10 years to make a work? Are you still a working artist? It just, it just, how many hours a day does it take to work, to, to, to train in your craft? What if you don't do that, can't do that? We don't even have structures that allow us to examine this, much less make the change in all of this. How long has this been going on? It's foundational. And it's messed up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this speaks back to Auntie Margot's work in decolonizing <laughs> our process. Right. Like, how we think about this. Like, conceiving of like our stories that we're going to like you know share with the world like well how is our thinking colonized like how is the how is the the template of of you know making things to sell a term that i bristle at i mean i i i uh was invited to speak in front of someone else's board of directors yesterday and the, the, the term selling, you know, mm -hmm. performances uh, came up and I, I, I couldn't let it sit. I, I corrected immediately. I, I said, uh, with, with due respect, I cannot sell. I cannot sell my culture. It is not mine to sell. It is, uh, I can share it. It is not for sale. People can experience it. They cannot buy it. And, uh, and this gets back to the notion that, that we sell our time. That we, you know, that, that, but how can you do that? Like, really, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a capitalist system, but in order to, to be, you know, in your culture, in your community, you really have to step back from that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing involved with culture and community really fits in the, the capitalist system. And there's, there's a story that I tell all the time when I go around mostly to like primarily white, because I, I'm a, I'm a warrior for my culture. I'm a warrior for like culture in general, because culture is the lens. And this is like my thing, you know, like culture is the lens and it's when people aren't connected with culture. But like I was sitting with this, this family I'm friends with, like um, the Echo Hawks. There's a lot of lawyers in this native family. And um, uh, there's, you know, there's aunties and uncles and ever that, 
thing like that sitting around and uh one of the youngins uh you know uh, talking and there's a a, a fellow who's going to a law school and the young and it's like wow if you're going to law school you're going to be a lawyer right you know this this said yeah yeah I'm, you know that's that's the you know the idea like you know fighting the courts for people stuff like that and the, this young and was like wow did, how much you make doing that and he answers wow yeah like you know, lawyers can make like up to $400 an hour. And the young one was like, oh, you know, if I made $400 an hour, I would like work one hour a week and spend the rest of the time with my family. And that, that's, that's an epiphany to people that like you stop after enough, like you take what you need and like, that's it. Like, it, you don't need money to be happy. I think people in the dance profession <laughs> understand that a lot more than everyone else because we're not exactly, you know, in the, the traditional economic sense, an overcapitalized field. Um, I think poets in the literary profession have the same, uh, the same sort of fulfillment from their work that sustains them where money might be. Uh, not there, but there's a societal transformation that this speaks to that needs to happen be before we can be healed, before right. the people who should be valued, the people who contribute. And contribution to community is the important part. It's how we treat our children and and our teachers and our elders and each other, how we express love, not how much money we make. No one's after you, you pass from this world. No one, how you, like however much money you, you make is going to honor you for that when you walk into the next world. But the work that, that we do through our culture and our art and our community, that is memorable. That is what we give to our children and our children's children as, as we, we become ancestors, right? So, I mean, that's a massive transformation. <laughs> yeah, that's an abolitionist work, for sure. Yeah. To move away from capitalism with every ounce of our, of our body and mind. And it's work. Go ahead, Alice. Oh, um, I was reflecting on, on that. Um, <laughs> I was reflecting on that. Um, because because the, um, the, it's, you know, I hate to be the glasses only, is, 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 is like only half full person, but I, I'm also kind of, uh, that's where I woke up today, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I worry, I worry. Today, I, I think I'm worried. I think I'm worried. Maybe perhaps I would have addressed this question differently, but today I am worried. Um, because although I hold hope, I, I, I worry that, that I won't be able to connect enough and communicate and transmit and leave witness and, and traces. Um, I worry. Um, I, I, I don't know if the foundations, the structures are there for the stability of the communication to, 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 to communicate. Like, I think my experience of being, of finding the threads and, and holding onto the threads in that, in their fragility, um, has, 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 it, today I'm in a place of fragility. And, and, and the recognition of stability, in, instability, even though instability is in, there's dynamism in instability. Um, I'm, I'm feeling the instability more strongly than I'm feeling the continuity. Um, 
And so, Andre, when you mention when you, when when you mention that transition, right, that journey, that work, um, that continuity is what stands out for me, and the recognition of my dif- my personal difficulty and the struggle to find it. Like, where is it located? How do I? How do I? How do, how does it? How does it come through me? You know, how does it? Yeah. That's that's what I'm resonating with. I'm just I'm I'm hearing your words and meditating on the the, the difficulty and the complexity of making that happen. Andre, you were talking about um, this young in, in your community who was observing if they made $400 an hour, what would they do with all of the other hours? And um, it's making me also think of uh, how, how can we think of a different currency for a period of time? How, 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 how might we think about dance as a nourishing period of time? Or, or a healing period of time? Or maybe we push against that question. Well, uh, that's a great question. I mean, when I was growing up, dance was, which was on the res, dance was a manifestation of our celebration, being together, of being alive, of being on um, on on our ancestral lands, um, uh, the tribe I grew up, uh, my tribe, wasn't displaced terribly much. Uh, And there were stories about, you know, the mountains around me and how they came to be and the the shapes that we see in our environment and that sort of thing. Um, it's, It's a... We feel struggle in my sort of observation now because we are we are in two worlds. The the colonization of North America and the subjugation, the war that happened in this this place that drove native people away and displaced our culture and continues to displace our culture um, created this dissonance and this is what we feel today and the colonization the war that happened you know centuries ago in other places around the world is is still making this dissonance that that the you know the values that belong are not the values that that people espouse and that, that to get food, um, you know, to feed ourselves and our families, it, you have to, you know, to a certain extent, engage with these colonist systems. I mean, there, are, there's, there's a, you know, a, a grand movement and it is grand of, of uh, decolonizing food systems in tribal communities across the country that we are learning to be farmers again that we are learning to connect with our land we are connect learning to connect with the people who work the land and that sort of thing and that pulls us away from these colonialist systems and i'm not saying that everyone necessarily needs to go and be a farmer but it's the idea it's the idea and there are there are people in every culture who make dances and there are people who work the land and there are people who, you know, and, and, and those, those systems work in concert and in harmony when they are well. And I mean, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of patience that needs to be had in my humble opinion. I mean, I don't have all the answers. Mm-hmm. No, no, I, no I one. I really does. don't no have all the answers. No I feel like I have a path, 
that I have found. And I am truly blessed to have that path that I have found. Um, I love that I, there's there's this this the, the the value that have silence in this conversation. It's yes, so right? refreshing yeah. to me. It's so I appreciate that so much. And I just wanna I wanna hold that space too. I wanna hold that broken space just as much as I hold the strong space with the same kind of maternal care. I, I wanna think about this conversation as food that really leans into like a place of true digestion that I can <laughs> actually like, like I can query that digestion in a way that is not monetary or monetized. You know, that that thing, that thing that I, that we have made here today or that we have remembered here, today can be held in a way that when we don't feel, when we're worried, when we're worried and, and when we're up against war, when we're up against the idea of the non-human, that we are a part of a larger, a larger capacity we're part of, um, I'm starting to see all these things go off. So they, they, you know, like we were, we're up against time. And so now I'm like, <laughs> I'm doing just the opposite of what we were like really massaging. But um, yeah, I, I, I also want to hold everyone in everyone. Um, thank you so much, ASL interpreters, Emilio and Lisa, Ronaldo. I, I want to say, I, I think about y'all all the time and I'm like, God, can I, could I separate my body in a way to be able to facilitate clarity with the language of my body? And I say, yes, I'm working on that. But I want to say thank you to, to everybody that's been a part of uh, Dance NYC Symposium today, from me to y'all, the people that I can't see, and all of y'all listeners like holding us deeply, I want to say thank you. Thank you. We're on the way out. The time warnings have been like flagged. Right. And you know I got to go there, right? You know I got to say it. Say to it. The dance, to the dance world, art is not therapy. We have talked about healing and wellness and moving through, but that doesn't mean that our art is therapeutic to, to, to the conditions that you may see us diagnosed with. Mm. These are deep and held and, and fiercely protected spaces. Yes. These are not words to diminish us or to diminish our work. These are not spaces that you can contain us with or with. These are spaces that step outside the known narratives. And I ask you to check your interpretive space as you approach and consider our work. Look for where your interpretive patterns are holding us in narratives that you tell us that we should be changing. Hmm. Come and understand the world as we build it. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, each. I feel like this moment when we're getting all of the time notifications is so tough, and you have each offered really beautiful open doors, um, and so I appreciate it. And I'm really grateful for this period of time that we've gotten to experience together. Thank you. Um, and I think now I turn things to Kyle Rudnick from Dance NYC. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. That was such a powerful conversation. Um, thank you, everyone, Kyle, Naya, Alice, and Andre. Um, 
also want to give thanks to the sponsors, to Tammy um, Milkowitz from Viscardi Center and Emilio Garcia and Lisa Reynolds from Sign Nexus for their invaluable support. So we are heading over to the session follow-up chat in the community section to take a few questions and wrap up this conversation. Um, what's next after that? Uh, Actually, you can go ahead and move your bodies at our daily dance break, which is happening right now, uh, being facilitated and presented by Kumbe Center for African and uh, uh, Diaspora Dance. Uh, like I said, that is going on right now. You can continue to experience the symposium. Visit our sponsors in the exhibitor hall, create virtual meetups and online conversations at our community board or take some time away from the screen and just rest. It is actually really beautiful outside. So if you want to step outside uh, and are in the New York City area, you can also explore more concepts within life cycles, livelihoods and legacies. We have six more daytime sessions coming up, three held at 12 p.m. and three more held at 2.30 p.m. At 1.30 p.m., you can take your lunch and or head over to the exhibitor hall for the virtual expo showcase. The virtual expo showcase will also be live at 5 p.m. with more presentations from our various sponsors. Tonight's program is a pivotal keynote conversation entitled Disabled Artists and a History of Dance, Activism, and Collective Care. An address by Cobet, excuse me, Corbett O'Toole about the evolution of dance, activism, and an ethos of collective care in the United States. What can dance artists today learn from investing in the rich history? The presentation will be followed by a response session with Dance NYC Disability Dance Artistry Residency Artists, curated with X. I wish you a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you for joining today's session. A special thanks to our funders, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Howard Gilman Foundation, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, New York State Council on the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Arts. A special thanks to our lead corporate sponsor, Con Edison, and our lead dance advocate, Jody Gottfried Arnold. Subsidies for the Education and Dance Worker ticket tiers are made possible by the Arnold Foundation. A special thanks to our leader, host, and partner level sponsors, 92nd Street Y, Harkness Dance Center, Dance Education Library, Cataliote Law, Full Out Creative, Gibney Dance Center, Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance, The Actors Fund, Ballet Hispanico, Fit for Dance, Nai Ni Chin Dance Company, NDI Collaborative for Teaching and Learning, New York Live Arts, and Tom O'Connor Consulting Group. And last, but certainly not least, a special thanks to our Justice, Equity, and Inclusion Partners, Art Beyond Sight, Art Space Sanctuary, Asian American Arts Alliance, Center for Traditional Music and Dance, the International Association of Blacks in Dance, Lotus Music and Dance, Museum Arts and Culture Access Consortium, National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, New York Foundation for the Arts, and Women of Color in the Arts. Up next, at 12 o'clock, we begin our early afternoon sessions. At 1.30, you may eat your lunch and visit our virtual expo showcase in our exhibitor hall. At 2.30, we begin our late afternoon sessions, and at 4.15, we gather in our daily debrief. At 5 o'clock, we revisit the exhibitor hall for more booth activity at our virtual expo showcase. And at 6 o'clock, we gather for our keynote presentation. Stay connected with us by posting your takeaways on social media using the hashtags DanceSimp, DanceNYC 2022, and DanceSimp 2022 on Instagram at dance.nyc, on Twitter at dance.nyc, and on Facebook at dance slash nyc. 
some features not to miss. Build your agenda of sessions. Connect with other attendees. Join community conversations. Visit the Exhibitor Hall. Don't forget to check out the 2022 Symposium Digital Program Book. How are we doing? Did you like a session? Use the like feature on your favorite session. Got feedback for us? Take the post-event survey after March 19th and tell us how we did. Need help? Email us at customerservice at dance.nyc. A special thanks to our broadcast streaming partners at Full Out Creative. Thanks for joining. Keep in touch at dance.nyc.